Yes. <clears throat> well, I want to thank uh, Nature's comments, and uh, also I'm very, I'm very uh, glad that that the, uh, the vision for Nate and, and Father Ed and the clergy to sort of have some sort of a Christian formation. I mean, there's there's so much, you know, there, our our faith is so so rich, and when uh, when we were sort of those of us who have taught in the past were asked to come together and discuss the possibilities for this uh, series, you know, I was really glad that the the issue of of uh, important Christians, you know, important uh, people who sort of uh, in one way or another, sort of, sort of shape the faith, or express the faith, or articulate the faith in a way, uh, the faith that we that we have today. And uh, you know, sort of, sort of uh, I've always loved history myself. I mean, I, my my first degree was in history. My my second one was in the classics. Of course, I studied classics and history at the same time. Uh, but I've always loved history, and I think it's I think it's extremely important. And I think it's something that, uh, well, I mean, I think in our time, I mean, it's something that's somewhat lost sight of. And and uh, the, the importance of history, I mean, one can always recite the old the old saw that, you know, those who do not know the lesson of history are doomed to repeat its mistakes and that. But I think there is something in history. Uh, God has created history. God created in history. God came into history in the Incarnation. And and uh, I think I've been, I've been become struck, uh, you know, in recent years with, with how, how very much God uses process in our lives and how God uses process both in our own lives and that. I think sometimes we would like things to come together very quickly, answers to be given very quickly. Uh, you know, I certainly know my students like to like to quick answer, they don't want to think, and stuff like that. But it's, it's actually part of part of God's creation, the way He's the way He's made us and the way He's made His world, uh, which remember was good originally, uh, was very good. And and that's so so history's a very important part, I think, of our of our uh, you know of, of our lives, uh, of, of the way we look at the world. Uh, and I think for Christians as well, I, I, I sort of came to church history somewhat later in, in my life and that, uh, though I was always interested in it. Uh, it's, very, it's very rich. It's very rich. Uh, I've given you, by the way, we're not going to go through this whole thing. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was casting about as uh, what might be the best way to try to cover 200 to 300 years of history in a way that might be somewhat meaningful. And I, I thought, as, as oftentimes I sort of, I feel that this is something hopefully you'll take home, and what I've tried to do is, is pull together some of the, some important people, events, and that in the first, uh, this is the first of two, two, uh, uh, two uh, talks here. And uh, this is sort of a, the, sort of general sort of overview of church history from the first to the third centuries. Uh, and then next week uh, we'll be talking about, about the later period. Um, hi. Uh, but I just, I thought what I'd do is, maybe, maybe, what I'd do is I, I thought I'd sort of hit on some of the themes that I think are important, uh, leaving you to, to look over this. I also have, uh, if, if you're interested, I have some, um, uh, which I'll give you later if you're interested. Uh, these are, these are some, some documents, uh, some documents, some relevant documents from, uh, you know, for example, from some Roman historians, Josephus, the Jewish historian. Uh, some, some, something from the uh, from the writings of, of uh, Saint Ignatius, his letters. Uh, something from uh, Clement of Rome's first epistle. Uh, but things that I want to see that uh, there is a, a voice that, that runs through here, that, that runs through church history. Uh, and, and I think that if, there, if there's one thing I would want to want to stress here, um, is that there is one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, which we say in the, in the creeds. And I think we say that sometimes, uh, you know. Um, I came, my original uh, association with the Christian faith was, was through, through Baptists and Presbyterians. Uh, the Baptists have, you know, not a whole lot of interest in history, I must say, in church history, and you sort of cover it perfunctorily. And I, by the way, I don't mean to, I, had, I learned a great deal from, from Baptist people and, and that. Uh, but, but I always felt a little uncomfortable because, the, because I, I knew that there was, there was more than just the, the trail of blood of, of independent churches that sort of ran through history and, and uh, you, know, you know, but there was a, there was a you know, there, there is a great church. I mean, there, there is a church. Uh, you, you, you may be aware that, you know, theologians speak of the, the historical church or the, I should say, the, the visible church versus the, versus the universal church. And, and there, there's a sort of distinction there. And of course, our interests are, are primarily with history here. But there is one, speaking of the unity, holy, speaking of its relation to God, and, and that it is, that it, uh, you know, that God has put his, uh, his, his, his endorsement uh, uh, that Catholic means actually Catholic has, has, is not originally has, has to do with Roman Catholic Church. It means the, the, the Catholicos in Greek means the whole, the whole the church in, in the world. 
Uh, apostolic means it, it has its roots in, the, in Christ and the apostles, which is extremely important, which we'll look at uh, uh, something I want to make sure we emphasize today. And of course the church. The church is uh, actually, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, ecclesia means literally the assembly, the ones who are called out. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you think of some of the, the references to the church in the, um, in the New Testament, uh, it's called the body of Christ, his body. Uh, obviously, there's, there's a. We'll talk a little bit more next week, perhaps, about some of the language, uh, the language, how language is used. You know, because obviously it's his body in a spiritual sense. Uh, it's also called the bride of Christ. We're said to be the bride of Christ, uh, and it's said to be have been a mystery, a mystery that, that that God kept from the ages. So there's a, there's a lot that the the, the uh, it's called the pillar and ground of the truth. I mean, there's a lot of things that that are said of the of the church that that sort of show I think it's it's great importance. Uh, uh, perhaps its supreme importance in, in, in the world and in God's, uh, God's, the holy history with which God has been dealing uh, uh, in, um, in human affairs. Uh, I, I always love that term. There, there's a German term, Heilsgeschichte, which is, which is literally holy history. And it's, what it is is, is uh, you know, and, and there, there's an interesting distinction in German between two types of history. There's history, which is basically just the, you know, the events of history, the facts, the, the who, what, the when, where, and the why. Uh, but then there's also the significance of those events. I mean, that, 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 you know, knowing the events of history doesn't mean that one knows the significance. And I, I tell my students in history, I said, the, it's essential to get the who, the what, the when, the where. Uh, in order to discuss the why, the why, the why is the deeper significance of things, and and that. So, um, but in case, uh, and I think we can apply some of these these themes to, or I should say, some of these principles to, to church history. So, just a quick survey here. Uh, t today, we're going to do the best we can to talk about the origins, uh, from the origins of the church, and which of course is is the day of Pentecost, um, in in either 30, 33, 34 uh, A.D. By the way, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, is, I, I still use that, I still use that dating. My students sometimes say, why don't you say, why don't you say C.E. or B.C.E.? I absolutely adamantly refuse. Uh, I, I, I will not use the Muslim calendar, uh, you know, I mean, I, I just, I, I use A.D., and, and uh, which is Anno Domini. Then, of course, B.C., of course, means before Christ, so there's no, there's no equivalent uh, Latin expression for that, but, uh, but in any case, um, so we'll talk about that. Maybe, to, and again, these dates, we have to, you'll be seeing a lot of circa. Circa Mabi dates. Circa means about, around, because we really don't know. We, we really do not know. There's a there's a few dates we can establish, but we, we simply don't know. I mean, our canon sort of of, of of date keeping and chronology were not always didn't have not always prevailed. In fact, it's rather modern, as a matter of fact, and that sort of thing. But so so roughly to to two fifty, uh, uh, and, and mainly in the West today. We'll talk about the church mainly in the West. Of course, you know the uh, again that that the division that, that that came to exist did not exist in the early church. Though there were some important divisions. I mean, the uh, the West was a language was Latin was a language. It was a language of of Latin. Though uh, we'll see that the early many of the, the earliest church fathers wrote in Greek. They wrote in Greek. I mean, these would be like Clement of Rome and Irenaeus of Lyon, and, and that they wrote in Greek because Greek was, um, you know, which is an interesting, you know, one can, one can consider the reasons for that, but, but the point is that, that you do have some Latin fathers, I mean, uh, like, like Tertullian and, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, Cyprian and, and that, but, but in any case, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But, but, and, and, and then next week, I thought we'd look more at uh, some of the Eastern, the, the very important developments in the church, in church history uh, around Alexandria and Antioch, two great uh, patriarchal churches of the, of the East, uh, leading up to the, to the uh, uh, Council of Nicaea. And, and I thought it might be interesting to consider you know, how uh, Constantine's conversion and, and the Edict of Milan in, three, in 313, how it really rather fundamentally changed the course of church history, and not always for the good. And, and I think it'll be interesting to consider maybe some of that too next week. So, um, well, okay, just, just quickly here, just, you know, uh, those, those of you who, who studied history of that, you know that, that putting history into its periods is very, very important. I mean, this periodization, they call it, you know. And, and I thought I might just sort of, that it's a good way to it's sort of, a, a, I want to say it's a, it, it, it gives you sort of sort of a, a framework for hanging things on, and and um, you know students are always very strongly resisting dates and stuff like that. They say I don't, I, I, I can't memorize those ten dates. You know, and meanwhile they know a thousand things about their latest uh, uh, their football heroes or their hockey heroes. You know, five hundred details and. 
uh, you know, and I, I used to use the example when I used to teach more history that, uh, you know, the, the, it, it's almost like the, the doctor said, you know, I, I, I never really was interested in learning all those nerves and those muscles and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that person to, to, to operate on you, okay, or the lawyer who never wanted to learn the, the laws and the precedents and stuff. So, so I mean, but no, the days are important. I mean, not that they're absolute, but they're, they're a way to sort, of, to sort of understand things in context, to understand a sequence and that sort of thing. Um, and of course, there are, you can imagine, there, I mean, you know, church history has been written for a very long time. We'll be talking about Eusebius momentarily here, but um, uh, and, and, and how we know what we know about the, the, about the church is very interesting in a lot of ways, and the historiography of the church and stuff. But, uh, but I'm just going to sort of give some, some rough uh, you know, parameters here, I think, which is probably the best I can do. But we, we usually speak of the Church of the Apostles as the first, the first phase. Uh, that, that is, you know, after Christ is resurrection and ascension then, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Uh, roughly, I mean, I think uh, dates from range from like 30 to 33, 34 A.D. Uh, is usually that time. Uh, and then the first and second generations of apostles. I mean, many of these were, uh, you know, they were, of course, contemporaries of Jesus who, who knew, had known him personally. Uh, and then, then their immediate successors. So usually that, that first generation uh, we call the Church of the Apostles. Uh, it's, it's sort of traditionally dated. Uh, it's thought that maybe St. John the Apostle uh, may, have, may have died about 95 or so. Uh, you know, but in any case, it's, it's roughly around 100. So from about 33 to 100 AD. Uh, then we have one, uh, the next age is sometimes or oftentimes called the, the Church of the Apostolic Fathers. Now, actually, that's a term that's that's really a bit of a misnomer here because um, this is basically a, a a group of documents, really, uh, that that were sort of it was sort of given this name. It, 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 for example, it's like letters from from St. Polycarp, you know, Clement of Rome, Ignatius. We'll, we, these names I'll be talking about momentarily here. Uh, then some, some other, uh, like, like Barnabas, you know, uh, allegedly the, the associate of St. Paul, uh, his letter, uh, the so-called Shepherd and Hermas, which is a very strange uh, document. It's a very mystical sort of, sort of prophetic sort of thing. And the Didache, uh, Didache a very interesting document that, that sort of shows early, early church practices and stuff like that. It's, it's been dated, you know, anywhere from like 70 AD, which would make it very early up to 170. So it's been dated quite, uh, um, uh, quite a range here. And as you can imagine, these, these early documents are very important because they, th though they're not really apostolic, I'm, there were some, for example, like, like Papias and Polycarp, who uh, and uh, uh, who, who knew the apostles? Um, you know, this is the, this is a tradition that that, that Papias uh, and and Polycarp, uh, both of whom lived in, in Asia Minor, Smyr Smyrna, and, and and that that they had known uh, that they had known Saint John particularly. He was he was the uh, longest surviving of the of the apostles. Um, you know. Uh, and, and that they don't even, therefore they, they, and it's interesting to consider, for example, we do have some, a letter from Polycarp, uh, you know, and, and, and that uh, it's interesting to consider how they look on, look on uh, what they've received. And I, and I think that will, that will show how important is the, the ongoing apostolic tradition here. Um, and then you have, uh, uh, you have then, then I think there's an important phase here, uh, what I call the sort of the earliest apologists. At some point, the church began to attract you know, very intelligent people, people who were educated in the uh, in the traditions of of the, of the Greco-Roman world. I mean, they were they were philosophers. They were they rhetoric, of course. The, the study of rhetoric was the was the goal of classical education. I mean, not just being able to make speeches, but uh, in in the public assembly or in the courts or that. But also, it involved. It was basically sort of an all-encompassing education. It was very much based in the in the classics of Greece and Rome, particularly the Greek classics, and that. Uh, and, but it also involved training in, in, uh, in logic and rhetoric and, and, and that sort of thing, which was, which was very, very important here. But you have some of these emerging. Uh, uh, some of them who, well, we, do, we actually do have uh, uh, the, it's, some of these things have been discovered within the last couple hundred years, which is sort of interesting. But some of the, a couple of the earliest ones are Aristides and Quadratus, who have, who have what are so-called, by the way, apology, please, doesn't mean I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's from a Greek word that means defense. It's a defense speech, is what it is. It's not. It's not apologizing in any way for the Christian faith. It's actually defending it. Probably the most famous apology is that of Socrates. You may, you may be aware of the apology of Socrates. He's not apologizing for anything. Actually, he's defending himself against the charges that were brought against him. And this sort of then becomes a model for many of these men who knew Socrates very well. Socrates, of course, was a martyr. I mean, he was a martyr uh, for for the for the Greeks and the. Uh, um, for the Greeks and the Romans who knew of him, I mean, he had been unjustly condemned, and that. Uh, 
Uh, and by the way, the, the fact that these men are, are intellectual people are able to then, then relate them, their, their, their training with, with, uh, with their understanding of the Christian faith. And that'll, that, that presents some interesting issues too. Because uh, there is a, I mean, you know, we have our Gospels, of course, and, and it'd be interesting that we'll talk later about, you know, how those Gospels came to be a little bit and when they came to be and, and that sort of thing. That's, that's all part of the, of the whole process here. But, um, but they, what they're, what's interesting is that, that, they're, that they're using essentially human rationality uh, and our rational powers to, to sort of understand Christianity and to try to explain it. Uh, many of these apologists actually wrote to emperors. Uh, they, they, they lived at a time when the so-called five good emperors ruled Rome, which were much more enlightened than your Caligulas and your Neros and your Domitians. I mean, but the five good emperors uh, were the emperors Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius, okay? Uh, roughly from about, uh, about 96 AD to about 180. So that period of time is, is when they're writing. So what Rome, did they do to be enlightened? What's that? What did they do to be enlightened? Uh, they were they were considered enlightened in, in that they, they they looked at just government. They they uh, some of them were, for example, Marcus Aurelius was a practicing Stoic philosopher. Uh, they, they they sought to rule according to, to law uh, rather than caprice. They they uh, they, they also uh, they they chose their successors by 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 uh, looking for for good men who would be able to succeed them. And so they they're, they're called the good emperors. You know, for, for for that reason, because really, and under the, uh, uh, Edward Gibbon, who's of course, as you know, is a, a historian of the Roman Empire, from mm -hmm. decline and fall, uh, says that under the Antonines, under Antoninus Pius in particular, that the world has never been in a happier state of, of, of life and that sort of thing, uh, because of good government, you know, prosperity and that sort of thing. So, what kind of an education did they give to their young people who were growing up during those times? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, because education was reserved for a very few. Education was reserved for a very few. Uh, it was, uh, the, the, the sort of education that they got was, was largely literary, uh, very classical, very much in the, in the literary classics. Uh, it did not involve things like, like, you know, things that are essential to us. I mean, things like science and mathematics and, and uh, you know, and, and, and uh, economics, that sort of thing. Things that we would consider essential to ruling. They, were, they ruled very philosophically, so it had been heavily philosophical. You know, uh, and that. Okay. Um, Sir, yes. Please. What are the dates that we're into? The... I'm just I'm just giving a survey right now, but that's that's uh, roughly the uh, the five good emperors is roughly from about you know 95 to 180 thereabouts. That's that's roughly that, that period of time when the when the when the, when the apologists lived. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then the next period I was really, really uh, tossing about as to what to call this because you know once you get past Justin, then you have some very important figures. You have you have, for example, like like uh, uh, Irenaeus, uh, and you have Tertullian. I mean, who who lived from let's say, for example, the, the late second century, which of course are the are the one hundreds, the late one hundreds into the two hundreds. Uh, that's a very, very important period, and I, I wasn't really quite sure what to call them. I mean, they're, uh, sometimes they're called the pre-Nicene fathers, you know, the, the, before the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea in 325 is a very, very important uh, watershed uh, in a lot of ways. It's the first ecumenical council of the church. Not the first council, by the way, but it's the first ecumenical council where represented, I forgot how many uh, bishops were there, but, but, but bishops from all over the, 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 the Christian world were there. Uh, and that's what's very, very important. Also, it also, it's the, as we as sort of came up last week, uh, the emperor oversees the council. You know, uh, you know, this will have some interesting ramifications later on. Uh, those of you who know something about Byzantine history have, may have heard the term Caesaropapism where the emperor is uh, is also the chief religious official. Though there's a patriarch, patriarch of Constantinople, he pretty much uh, has his position at the at the disposition of the emperor. Uh, but that that whole thing, these are important things that will have ramifications later in European and, and also uh, Byzantine history. Um, so in any case, that, that's a very important turning point. So, but then you have these important men uh, before there. I mean, and, and uh, there is a there is a tradition that continues though, and and, and that's what, uh, something I want to try to try to make make evident here. So I, I call it the uh, uh, I call it the post apostolic fathers or the pre Nicene. I, I can't think of a better word for that. Uh, and and in the West you have uh, and there's sort of a, there's a Western Eastern division. It has a lot to do with the Latin and Greek languages. Okay, but uh, but for example, Tert Tertullian, uh, Irenaeus, for example, who Irenaeus originally came from from um, from Asia Minor. He, he knew Polycarp of Smyrna. Uh, he came to Gaul 
which evidently was was heavily uh, uh, the, the Roman Empire was 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 economy was everywhere. I mean, there was a it was a universal economy. People traveled uh, all over the place. I mean, there was there were there were there was a uh, at Rome uh, the language of the church was Greek at Rome. I mean, the center of the Roman Empire was the early language of the church was Greek. There were a lot of Greeks. Uh, Greek-speaking peoples, we sometimes call them Hellenists, but they were Greek-speaking peoples at Rome. And there were large colonies of, 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 of uh, Greek-speaking peoples elsewhere. Um, but in southern Gaul, Lyon, uh, which the Romans called Lugdunum, uh, was, was heavily populated by, by Syrian people. And of course, as today, uh, when people, immigrants from other countries come, they, they tend to establish neighborhoods and stuff like that. It was, it was that way back then, too. In any case, uh, Irenaeus then came from from uh, from his home then as a young man uh, and made his way to to Gaul where eventually he becomes the bishop of Lyon uh, and and that a very very important figure uh, I've been reading lately his, uh, his he's famous for his uh, his uh, against the heretics or the refutation of knowledge falsely so called which is against the early some early Gnostics we'll talk about that later but I just discovered recently something that was was discovered in an Armenian version maybe you know hundred years ago but his uh, his more theologically he calls it the the exposition of the apostolic teaching which is absolutely fascinating I mean, to to read uh, it's, it's really profound in a lot of ways theologically and and that and I was unaware of it and I've just been looking at that recently but but a really a, a very interesting man Irenaeus um, there's also Tertullian, Tertullian of Carthage. Uh, actually, not a, most of these others are saints. Let me just here. Most of these other saints. Tertullian is not a saint. <laughs> and I mean, there, there's uh, not. not he's, he was a, uh, a very devout Christian man, a very great defender of the faith, but not a very nice person. Yeah. It's because he, he was because he's a lawyer, right? And he was yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, see, he, he, was, he was actually not a practicing lawyer. He certainly argued like one. So, so it yeah. isn't the most of, actually. That, Yes. Sometime in, in this period, they, the, a distinction was drawn between the writings that become part of the canon of the New Testament, and the, all these people seemed to write. They were writing and explaining the faith. They were, you know, they were right. um, they were writing and sending letters like Paul was. But at some point, a line was drawn. You know, there was a council later that determined. You know, you're going to say this, I guess, what the authorized books were. In scripture, right? But you're describing a period that, at least to me, seems like it includes a continuum. You have all of Paul's writings and the other epistles and the gospel accounts, and you have these other sort of theological works that are being written, published, distributed, right. influential. But but at some point, it was just determined these are sort of scholarly works, and we'll see more of them conceivably. This is scripture. How did that, that's, that's very important. I, I want to look at the issue of canonicity, canon, canonization. I'm going to look at that. that. What you say is very important. I, I think there is a, you know, if you think of it sort of like, it's, it's almost like a symphony where there's a, there's an under, there's a theme that, that just sort of is there. And, and eventually it will emerge, you know. Uh, but, but, but so, but, but, the, but the question, I, I think I would approach that under the issue of authority. You know, the, what, what, constitutes, what constituted authority. But you're absolutely right. There were a lot of writings. And there were a lot of things that, we still that, that, use that them. attempted to pass the scripture. But we'll talk, I'm going to touch on that in a sec here. But, but uh, there were a lot of things that, that wanted to pass the scripture, but were not actually accepted by the church. And one thing, uh, one thing I would say, because I certainly could say this in a, among people of faith here, but I think we should never, ever out, uh, rule out the role of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in all of this. You know, I mean, if you want to just look at it as, as, uh, as some historians have done, as, as pure dialectical. I mean, some people have been used, for example, Hegelian dialectic to say, well, this really church history is, is a question of, of Pauline versus Petrine Christianity and law versus grace and stuff like that. And those are there's an interesting way of looking at some of these things. But but I think the the role of the Holy Spirit in all of this and and that and and I I certainly know my own life. I I think I, I I know far more when I look back at my life than when I'm sort of in the midst of it, trying to look into the future. But I, I think we understand a lot more when we look back, and we're able we're incredibly fortunate to have so much of, of what we what we have, you know, then it becomes a question of sifting and stuff like that. But we'll talk about these please. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> the New Testament is primarily written in Greek. Uh -huh. And the Neoplatonistic nature of that comes about because of the history of Alex of Alexander. And the fact the whole eastern part of of the Mediterranean was part of his fiefdom. Absolutely. Yeah. When when he conquered. So 
that is one of the reasons why things like Neoplatonism and Christianity became enforced, because that was what the educated people at the time knew. Well, of course, Neoplatonism comes in much later. You know, Platonism, Platonism of course, is, goes back to the time of Plato, but then with so-called Neoplatonism will become an important force, and that's right. And, and, you know, and the degree to which, shall we say, for example, St. John's Gospel is, uh, he speaks of the Logos, okay? Uh, that's, these are very yeah, interesting discussions, terms. yeah. So, but, but, you know, Christianity is not, I mean, we are part of our culture. And, and, and uh, the degree to which, uh, you know, people are influenced by their culture, I mean, there, there are varying degrees of influence. Some people, I mean, the, 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 Jew, the Jewish people, for example, were, were pervasive in the Roman Empire. That's probably one of the reasons why, why Christianity spread so quickly, is because what we know from the book of Acts that Paul went, first of all, to the Jewish communities, and then there were many people who they were well aware of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, by the way, was the first Christian uh, uh, scripture. Uh, and, and then they and then they were the, so they were converted. So, but, but Christians were very much a part of their culture. And, but there were some who actually there, there was a question of what relation do we have to our culture? You know, what, what is what is the, and this comes up this comes up everywhere in St. Paul. You know, and, and, and that in his letters, how are Christians to relate to the world? And that so that's that's yet another interesting. Another. Um, so in any case, uh, you have then uh, and then you have Cyprian. I, I think I was talking about C Cyprian of Carthage. Uh, so, and I, I'm sort of setting this up uh, a little bit for uh, uh, for when we talk about Saint Augustine, I mean, because they, who's the greatest of the Western theologians, and in many ways the father of the Western Church. Uh, he's not as much appreciated in the Eastern tradition, however, Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine. Uh, but in any case, he's very important. But in any case, you have Tertullian, Cyprian, uh, and then you have Saint Augustine uh, coming up later here. And I'll, I'll just throw out the name Hippolytus of Rome. I mean, who's uh, just to show you that there were some at Rome. But interestingly, Rome is not really the epicenter of theology at this time. Those are, there's some very important things that are taking place. Rome. Marcion, one of the earliest heresies of the church, Marcion, Marcionism was actually at Rome, and that. So, so we'll, we'll certainly Rome as the center in the heart of the Roman Empire will very naturally play a very, very important, important role here, okay? Uh, then, of course, you have your, uh, your uh, Nicene Fathers, you know, Ath Athanasius for being one of the greatest ones, and that sort of thing, in the, and leading up to the First Secular Council. So that, that just sort of gives this general sort of sense of the surveys here. Uh, sources. Um, there are so many issues, as, as were raised here, of dating, authenticity of sources, uh, the, the sifting process that needs to take place here. Uh, you know, this is, I mean, to, to some extent, the sort of the... Um, what do I say? How do, how do I say this? Uh, there's, there's, it's been a field day, you know, for uh, for a lot of people. The nature of the sources, how you authenticate the sources, uh, you know, just using pure reason. I mean, there, I think I think it's very very fair for for people of faith to to say that that faith plays an important role here. But I mean, for for for. For secular scholars, I mean, you know, these are they're not issues. They're not issues of faith that come into to the thing at all. So, and you have all these quests for the historical Jesus. What was Jesus of Nazareth really like? What can we really know about him? When there's then there's great questions about the nature of our, of our early documents. Okay, or the Jesus Seminar, which has sort of run its course, but uh, that was quite the thing maybe ten years ago. Bart Ehrman is sort of the latest one to uh, you know uh, uh, to sort of hold the field in terms of uh, you know coming up with multiple Christianities and stuff like that. I mean, there's just a lot. There's a lot that's that's out there, and I think it's very confusing for a lot of people. That, that's why I think it's good and and really really important that that uh, you know that churches recognize these issues and, and I mean make. Uh, there's just a lot of books out there that are, and, and I constantly will have people coming to me and saying, well, what about what about uh, the, uh, Jesus the Zealot or Jesus was this or Jesus was that? You know, uh, and and uh, what, what what I've always found I, for me, I will say personally, very important is that. There are scholars of equal credentials who do not take the evidence the way, for example, that Bart Ehrman does. They are no less, his credentials, they are no less informed. Uh, they, will up, they will believe in the traditional views that the church upholds. Uh, the, 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 shall we say the more conservative viewpoint? So it's not as if it's a matter of intellect. It's not a matter of intelligence. It's not a matter of where you have your degrees from. There's other things that are, that are at work here, okay? Uh, and, and so, so I think that's I think that's very important to keep in mind that you can always find something who will counter uh, some of these things that, that sort of say undermine <coughs> and challenge the faith of the people. There are there are always others uh, to to uh, who, who will who will uh, uh, uphold other viewpoints. Okay, uh, quickly here, uh, New Testament writings, uh, which Richard was talking about here. Uh, they, they get, the fact is, they came together over time. 
God works through uh, through means. I mean, uh, he, he works through secondary causes. I mean, he uh, doesn't just say hocus pocus and there it is. I mean, these are, uh, you know, they're, God, for, for whatever his eternal purposes are, works through means. I mean, we, we, we live, you know, we, we live through through uh, through process and that sort of thing. So there was a, it's, there's no question that, that these things came together over a period of time. And there was a sifting process. Uh, for example, the Epistle of Barnabas was accepted by, by many churches as, as uh, and, and very uh, and, and important fathers of the churches as the Epistle of Barnabas. It's, it, at some point, though, it was not accepted. Is uh, I think just to make sort of the, the, the short answer here is that is it basically as shall we say various uh, bishops and leaders of churches came together. They were the ones. It was those. It was those as a sort of. Well, let's see. We, we have these books here. What are? What do you think? And just to sort of imagine the situation here. But then, then they would. There was sort of a consensus that was reached in the in this in this process here. Okay. But there was. A, there's no question that there was a, that the New Testament writings as we have them came together over time. There are outside references to Christianity. I mean, there's there's uh, the, the Roman historians Tacitus and Suetonius. And if you're interested in those um, uh, sheets I have here. Uh, uh, you can have them afterwards. There's some references to, to them. I mean, Suetonius, uh, uh, the, the first reference we have is in, is in Tacitus. In the, in the, uh, he, he writes the, his, the uh, Lives of the Twelve Caesars, and, and he says that in the, uh, these are sort of intriguing things. This is uh, in the, in, uh, this would have been about 50, 50 or so AD. Uh, he says that, that there was a, there was a, that it, Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. They were periodically expelled from Rome. Um, because of the turbulence of the followers of a certain Crestus, Crestus, and uh, uh, which was a common name for slaves, but, but many scholars think that actually it was probably Christos that, that he had sort of misconstrued or, the, or his sources sort of misinformed him. But but there's there, there's references there. There are, there are references to uh, the first great persecution of the church was under Nero, uh, the emperor Nero, and uh, there are reference, explicit references to Christians there. Uh, and again, the, you can tell that the Romans don't have a very good good estimation of of the Christians, though. Uh, 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 what they called their religion was called a superstition, a superstitio, which was a, which was a, not a good thing to, to be. Uh, also, they were considered to be uh, antagonistic to society and not good citizens. That we'll talk about that momentarily here. Okay, um, but in any case, and also, and then the letter of Pliny. Pliny, Pliny writes around one one twelve or so. Uh, he was a, a provincial governor, a, a personal friend, and a high official in the Roman government. Personal friend of the Emperor Trajan, and he writes. He comes across groups of Christians in in uh, Bithynia, which is actually just in the northern part of Turkey, just below the uh, the, the, the Black Sea there. Uh, he's the governor of that region there. And he's come across these groups of Christians, and he says he doesn't know how to deal with them. I mean, they, uh, they, they were also, apparently by this point, I mean, simply to be called a Christian was a crime. Even to be named a Christian was a crime, okay? Uh, uh, and, and many Christians will talk about the name, and Paul speaks about the name and, and, that, and that sort of thing. But, but so basically, there was you were sort of, and of course, in this society, you were you were guilty to prove an innocent. So, uh, and of course, a, a Roman governor was the was the chief. Uh, uh, he was the chief uh, official and chief judicial official in his province, had absolute authority under the emperor. Uh, but in any case, it's interesting to see with the simple lives of these Christians, and 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 actually, uh, you know, we read about a deaconess, for example, a woman who's a, who's a deacon. Um, and that, and he, he's not too sure how to how to handle them. So we, we get we get some insight into how the Romans dealt with the Christians and that. And also, it's interesting that the Emperor Trajan says that, that you're not to seek them out. You know, let them. You know, basically, you know, let sleeping dogs lie. You know, you're not to seek them out. You're not to take. You're not to take uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, anonymous accusations against people and that sort of thing. So there's a that's one of our enlightened emperors there. Uh, but again, these these little. Tantalizing little little insights in that that uh, you know uh, you know one one might use to try to create the broader picture of what's going on here. Uh, well, uh, I would say probably our greatest source uh, is is Eusebius. By the way, we heard about a certain Eusebius last week. That was Eusebius of Nicomedia, who was an Arian bishop. Uh, that's not this one. Eusebius is a fairly common Greek name here. This is Eusebius of Caesarea, who was a personal friend of the Emperor Constantine. In fact, writes a life of Constantine. Uh, he uh, his his dates were 260 to 340. Uh, but his great ecclesiastical history of the church. What he endeavors to do is to pick up from the time of the apostles, essentially after say uh, after after Luke's uh, uh, the book of Acts in Luke, and that and he attempts that. And of course, he had he had access to a lot of things uh, things that we don't we don't we no longer have. Now that doesn't mean that everything that Eusebius says is completely accurate. I mean, he certainly, as all historians, had a certain viewpoint that he had. Uh, 
he tended to favor the Arians, at least when that when that comes up later on, and that sort of thing. But but, but the point is that he's a very important source because I mean he sometimes has the only information we have on certain uh, on certain uh, uh, aspects of history. Uh, but he's certainly one of our most important ones. And I thought some of the themes. I mean, these are just some of the things I was going to throw out here. But certainly the emergence and rapid growth of the of the Christian faith is, is extremely impressive. I mean, it's, it's, it grows very quickly. Uh, of course, this involves the spread of the gospel, the nature of what the gospel was, uh, into the cultural context. Uh, uh, certainly a theme that's very important in early church history is Christianity versus Judaism. Uh, Christianity, of course, is, is born in within Judaism. Jesus was, of course, a Jew. This is an issue nowadays in, in the, the degree to which, uh, you know, uh, uh, early Christians were Jews and, and that. Uh, not, I'm not I'm talking about the nature of early Jewish Christianity and that. Um, but certainly they had common roots. Uh, you know, uh, it, but you hear a lot. I would say Paul talks a lot. You, you, you sense that there's a lot of tension with, with, the, with the synagogues. I mean, there, at some point, the, the Jews, of course, the, the big distinction being the fact of who's the Messiah. I mean, you know, and Jesus could not have been the Messiah uh, because they were, you know, most Jews were expecting a Messiah to free them from Rome and and establish, reestablish uh, Israel as a, as a as a as a in the Jewish nation as as a, a preeminent nation. I mean, this is what they were expecting. This is the way they interpreted the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah because those prophecies were were interpreted by Jews as prophetic uh, of, of the Messiah and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but the, and, and of course the, the, the temple, very, very important part of, of Jewish life, with the sacrifices, the mosaic sacrifices were performed. Therefore, when the, t when the temple in Jerusalem itself is destroyed by the Romans in the first war, Jewish War of 70, this is an important break. This is an important, uh, important uh, uh, a break with, with, uh, with, within uh, Christian-Jewish relations here. And it's becoming more and more clear to, to the Jews and the Christians both that, uh, who, should we say, who uh, you know are, are sorry the Jews and the Gentiles bigger part Jews and Gentiles are Christians that there uh, in fact there there is a trend of Judaism that continues uh, uh, to 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 hold to its Jewish roots and uh, we'll talk about this when we talk about her heresy next week but the so-called Ebionite Jews I mean they, they really never accepted that Jesus was uh, was was really uh, divine. Uh, that he certainly was prophetic, like a prophet, like the old prophets and that sort of thing. But there, there was this, there was this trend in Judaism. But then there were, of course, those who were assimilated into an increasingly Gentile-dominated church here. Okay, um, the uh, the Jewish versus Paul. Paul is considered a heretic among the rabbis. Uh, you know, uh, a heretic. Um, you know, the, and the whole idea of law versus grace. This is a, this is, a, you know, this is an ongoing issue, and it's, and I can't say that it's really ever been resolved. But, but the point is that what's the, what's the relationship between the law and grace and that sort of thing, or, or shall we say, I mean, the, the, the idea that, that Peter, you know, representing sort of, well, the, the famous passage, the so-called incident at, uh, at Antioch, where, where Paul withstood Peter for, uh, for. Uh, who had been associating with the Gentiles, but then when, he, then when, then when certain leaders from Jerusalem come, uh, he then dissociates himself from the, the Gentiles and starts associating only with the Jews. And, and, and Paul uh, accuses him of hypocrisy to his face uh, and that. So, so there's, there, there's, there's this tension. Uh, and also, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, also the, the whole idea of, of, of John's gospel and the Logos philosophy uh, are, are important. Uh, also, the relations appreci appreciated to its culture. Um, the, uh, the the whole uh, you know uh, even though it was pagan, I mean you know only the simplest people really believed the old myths about Jupiter changing into various animals to seduce women and stuff. I mean those were those were part of the lore and stuff like that. But there was a it was a very syncretistic time. It was a time when people were, were looking for for uh, for salvation. There were the, may have heard of the mystery cults of the ancient Greeks and stuff like that. People were looking uh, for, for ways, they were, they were looking at the next life and that sort of thing. There was a great deal of syncretism and that, uh, uh, and Christianity then uh, was at least at first seen to be sort of under Judaism's umbrella and that. Uh, later then it became, as I said, a superstition is a bad term to the Romans. I mean, it means, I mean, our word superstition, uh, it, it meant actually, it implied subversion. I mean, it was, it was not only absurd, but it was also subversive. And, and so that, that, was, uh, uh, um, uh, that was a factor. Also, whereas, whereas Judaism was, was what the Romans called a, a legal religion, a religio licita, Christianity was not. And, and to be an illegal religion was to, to fall afoul of the Roman law. Uh, there, were, there were not that many religions that the Romans declared that, but they, when they, uh, they, when they, 
when a religion was, was Ill Ill illegitimate or illegal, then it was treated uh, with, with very great harshness. And, and uh, not to say that uh, you know, the Christian was, con there was constant persecution, which there wasn't, but, uh, but, but whenever, there, there were periodic ones, as, as we'll look at in a moment here. Some of the popular misconceptions of the church, uh, I mean, it was very offensive to many people that, that the people would worship a crucified carpenter. And crucifixion was the worst punishment that the Romans had uh, inflicted on the worst criminals. Uh, no Roman citizen could be crucified. Uh, it was against it was against Roman law. Uh, uh, we, we have interesting representations. There, there's some of Jesus. Uh, they, they have a picture of a, of, a, of a man on a cross, but with a, with a donkey's head, with an ass's head, so showing how people, many people looked at, at Christians at the time. Uh, it was also religion. It, it appealed. It had seemed to had had uh, an appeal to women and slaves. I mean, that, which was very degrading uh, to to the people of this time. Also, there were all sorts of stories of its terrible nocturnal rites. I mean, cannibalism. You know, they were accused of, of cannibalism, uh, probably, probably because again these were these were popular misconceptions, probably because of the, the eating the flesh of Christ was pro was probably there, or uh, gross sexual immorality, you know, and some have speculated this probably had to do with the with the uh, by the way these were represented sometimes in art and stuff like that in, in like uh, that uh, and even incest because of the love between brothers and sisters and that sort of thing and and that which seemed to uh, offend a lot of people even this highly immoral time uh, but also one of the things that that sort of brought them into political uh, conflict was the fact that they didn't really participate in the civic duties of, of most people of the empire I mean they were there, there was a there was a secrecy to the Christians and and uh, which of course you can uh, understand uh, but part of it were that were the, the early liturgies I mean people uh, people who were not uh, had not we well, had to be were baptized of course brought you into the into the Christian uh, into the Christian faith but there was also the next stage of, of actually going through catechesis, through catechism and that, uh, and uh, only those who had been, had gone through catechism and been confirmed were admitted to the, the Holy Rite of the Eucharist, okay, which was secret and kept, and kept, kept secret uh, from, from, from other people. Uh, so there were a lot of reasons that, that people sort of oppose them. Uh, the persecutions, I'll just mention these, there were supposedly ten persecutors, uh, uh, which is probably not the case here, but some of the most famous ones, of course, were Nero. We know that persecution, which was not empire-wide, it was local, and uh, probably because he was trying to shift blame for the great fire of Rome to, to a, a hated group. Uh, Domitian, under whom uh, uh, St. John was sent to the island of Patmos. Marcus Aurelius, uh, again, these were just localized. Uh, the one under Marcus Aurelius uh, was, was, was against mainly against... Uh, uh, Christians in, in southern southern France, southern Gaul. Uh, actually, one emperor. Uh, there was also one under Severus, uh, Septimius Severus, uh, uh, in the time of of, uh, uh, of Tertullian. Uh, it's interesting that his successor then, Severus Alexander, actually uh, was it was a very secretistic man. He had a statue of Jesus along with Abraham and and other great uh, you know uh, uh, sort of religious leaders in his that he kept in his personal. His personal shrine. So, so it's it's interesting to see the, the sort of secretism. And of course, then then we will mention Decius uh, at two fifty was a very was the first time that the that the uh, persecution was empire wide. And then and then of course lastly, which we'll talk about next week maybe is Diocletian. Diocletian, the great persecution of three hundred three, which was right before the time of Constantine. And then this of course gave rise to martyrdom. Uh, you know, the whole idea of, of the martyrs. Martyrs were those who had actually given their lives to, for the faith. Uh, St. Ignatius, uh, on his way to Rome to be martyred, begs the Romans not to try to, to use any influence so that he won't be martyred because they were powerful people. He, was, he wanted to be eaten by the beasts and that, and, and you can see that in some of his letters. Uh, there were also confessors, those who had actually undergone torture, that but had not actually been killed. Um, then there were the laps, the question of what to do about people who, for example, would, because in order to, in order to, to uh, either prove that you weren't Christian or that you were actually loyal to the Roman government, you had to sacrifice to the statue of the emperor. And, uh, and, that, and those, there were people who weakened under the threat of torture, and the tortures were, of course, horrible. Uh, uh, or your family was, was threatened in that. So they would sometimes would then lapse and, and would say, well, God will forgive me. But then it was a question of how to deal with these people who have, have actually not, not faced martyrdom in that. This, of course, gave rise to, you know, to uh, veneration of martyrs. This is an interesting thing in early church history, uh, veneration of relics and stuff like that, because this goes way back. I mean, uh, having been a martyr was really quite a, I should say a confessor, which was, very, was a very important role to have. Christian intellectuals we talked about, uh, attracted well-educated well people. Uh, and, that, and then, of course, the question which, uh, and I want to have a couple minutes for 
the questions here. Uh, the authority. The question of the Old Testament. Uh, maybe we talk about this a little bit more. Uh, the scriptures of the of the early Christians was the Septuagint, okay? And of course, uh, mainly mainly the the um, um, I say here? mainly the, the prophecies of the Old Testament. The prophecies of the Old Testament, which which uh, predict a Messiah or predict a, you know the coming of the Gentiles and these sort of things are are very important scriptures. And, and these these of course were the first was the first sort of sort of, should we say, grist for the mill of, of Christian argumentation with the Jews and that sort of thing, but the Old Testament scriptures, they're coming together through Testament writings, and of course, which the sifting process left some that were so-called apocryphal, apocryphal writings, uh, and then some that are actually pseudepigraphic, which are forgeries, basically, uh, of that. Uh, so the whole con pra practice of can canonization. By the way, canon, canon is, a, is a Greek word that means like a measuring rod. So a canon is what is what, sort of what measures up, what, what measures up to be actual holy scripture in, in equivalent to the Old Testament and that. Um, and it's interesting that, that I think one of the first earliest canons we have is, well, of course, there is one Marcion. Marcion, the heretic Marcion, uh, had a, came up with a canon whereby he accepted only the Gospel of Luke uh, and, and uh, ten of Paul's letters. Uh, this may have precipitated the church, at least at Rome, in looking for what, what, what then are the scriptures that we accept. And, uh, and in, in uh, um, about 170 or thereabouts, uh, something called the Muratorian Canon, interestingly named after a man who discovered it in 1740, actually he came up with a list, uh, or say, either the, this contains a list, uh, of, of what were considered canonical at that time, which includes almost all of this, the scriptures we accept in the New Testament, interestingly. Um, also, the role of the bishop, very, very important. Um, you know, uh, from, you know, Paul speaks of bishops, he speaks of, uh, speaks of bishops, episcopoi, speaks of presbyters, elders, and he speaks of deacons, okay? The relationship of those church, church officials, uh, by the way, priest comes from presbyter, um, and, and that sort of thing. But, but the, 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 how the role of the bishop begins, gains increasingly great authority, particularly in the face of heresy. Uh, as sort of the center of, of the church and that sort of thing. St. Ignatius uh, talks about how important it is that, that, that the bishop is really the set, in the same way that, that, uh, that, the, uh, that the father is over Christ, the bishop is over the church, as Christ is over the church, and that sort of thing. So this whole, you can sort of see the beginnings of this notion of what will later become then a notion of apostolic succession and that sort of thing, which of course uh, the, the papacy then will take uh, and lay its claims to. Um, and I thought, we'll just, we'll just end with this if you don't mind. I'm sorry, I've taken more time than I want to. Uh, I just want to read something from, from um, I think I'll read the one from, from Irenaeus about apostolic tra tradition here, okay? He says, uh, though dispersed throughout our whole world, the church, though dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith. And then, this is one of the earliest sort of confessions of faith here, okay? Uh, she believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them. One, one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation. And the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensation of God and the advent and the birth from a virgin and the passion and the resurrection from the dead. The ascension into heaven and uh, in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus, our Lord. His future manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father to gather all things in one, to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race, in order that to Jesus Christ our Lord and God and Savior and King, according to the will of the invisible Father, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth and under the earth, everything should confess to him. He should execute judge, just judgment toward all the church, having received this preaching and his faith, though scattered throughout the world yet, as if occupying but one house carefully preserves it. She also believes these points of doctrine just as if she had but one soul and one of the same heart, and she proclaims them and teaches them and hands them down with perfect harmony as if she possessed only one mouth. For although the language of the world, uh, languages of the world are dissimilar, yet the import of the tradition is one the same. Nor will any one of the rulers in the church however highly gifted he may be in point of eloquence, teach doctrines different from these, for no one is greater than the master. Nor, on the other hand, will he who is deficient in power of expression inflict an injury on the tradition. For the faith, being ever one the same, uh, neither, does one, neither is one able at great length to discourse regarding it, make any addition to it, nor does one who can say but little dismiss it. And I, guess I would end with saying that I think that that's a fairly important statement of, of, uh, of, uh, of the nature of the apostolic tradition. So we uh, thank all of you. That was, uh, that was a tour de force in the uh, first oh, yeah. <laughs> so.